So this commentary paper by Impelazeri and colleagues has revisited some earlier work regarding the concept of load, namely internal and external load back in 2003. While the concept was originally proposed for use in team sports, we've also seen this expand into individual sports too. In essence, the training process consists of an applied uh, stress and an adaptative response to that stress or stimulus. As noted by the authors, an exercise bout induces a psychophysiological response to the exercise or the stress applied to the athlete. It is the response to the exercises that determines the adaptation and not sometimes thought the exercise itself. However, if too much of a stimulus is applied and not enough at recovery uh, to allow for adaptation, it may not be in the best interest of the athlete. Conversely, if a training stimulus isn't applied often enough, this might see a performance decline. Therefore, if we are to consider training adaptations, we need to have an understanding of the systems that determine performance. As training load isn't particularly well defined in the literature, it could be described as an abstract concept that helps us try to explain how the training stress applied creates stress, fatigue or fitness adaptation. The authors of this commentary have described training load as either internal or external. These are two different concepts but complement each other. External load in the respect of team sports such as football could simply be described as the work performed. External load may be uh, measured in a variety of ways such as the weight lifted or GPS metrics such as total distance or high intensity distance and so on. As the authors note, coaches prescribe the external load to gain the desired psychophysiological response or the internal load. In fact, the concept of internal load encompasses all of the psychophysiological responses that occur during the exercise, bout or training session. Measures of internal load may include heart rate, blood lactate or session RPE. However, the authors note that there is currently no gold standard for external or internal load measures. Therefore, context is the key. As noted, heart rate as a marker of internal load may be a valid measure for internal load during endurance training, but less so for resistance training. The authors suggest that monitoring internal load should be used as a primary measure when monitoring athletes. The internal response to the external load is, however, very individual, with both modifiable factors such as training status and nutrition, and non-modifiable such as genetics, psychological status, which potentially determine the athlete's response and set up subsequent adaptation to the external load applied. As the authors know, it is difficult to determine an athlete's internal load before the session begins. For example, a measurement of psychophysiological response to training, such as RPE, may also be influenced by heat or altitude. Another salient point by the authors is that practitioners may try to estimate internal load based on some measures of external load. However, not without conceptual limitations, as it can't be assumed that there is a direct response between the external load and the individual response. As two athletes don't respond to the same session in the same way, the authors suggest the uncoupling of external and internal load to assist with identifying how an athlete is responding to a training or training session and assist in the management of fatigue. An example the authors give is that while muscle fatigue increases both heart rate and RPE, mental fatigue only increases RPE. While these are both measures of internal load, the outcome is different. Therefore, understanding this uncoupling may help practitioners decide on the intervention to reduce fatigue, for example, a reduction in muscle damage in exercise or improving sleep hygiene. 15 years after the conceptual model was first presented, we're now more widely exposed in research and practice to the concepts of both internal and external load. In this paper, the authors have highlighted the importance of using internal load, especially when monitoring athletes, and put across salient points as to why there are limitations in just monitoring external load only. 15 years on and the conceptual framework is still strong. However, the authors have added to their previous work in this paper by highlighting the conceptual advantages of using context to understand the training response, both from external and internal load perspectives.